but uh, it's wonderful. Sometimes you work and work and work and try to get things together and put a song together, and other times God just gives them to you. Like I mean, it just came, just one verse after another. Before I knew it, I had a song. So today I hope it goes along with the message we're talking about today of Jesus enters Jerusalem. And I want to bring this a little up to date and make a comparison, if you will, that you may have not ever seen before, but you're going to see it this morning. A comparison between when Jesus entered Jerusalem and today. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees, went out to meet him, and began to shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Notice who the crowd was. It wasn't the locals there in town. It wasn't the biggity bigs and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Notice the large crowd who had come to the feast. That means the people, the common people that had come from all around who had heard about Lazarus who had heard about the miracles that Jesus was doing, had heard all these things. That's who it's talking about here when it says the ones who had come to the feast, the crowd who had come to the feast. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 27, Paul writes and says, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. The common people. Mark Lowry said, we were listening to him last night, and Mark Lowry made the comment, he said, if I'd have come, I wouldn't have been coming, been born in a trough with a bunch of animals around. He said, man, I'd have come, had me a golden stairway coming down from heaven, and I'd have had Gable out there blowing the horn to announce I was coming, and I'd have had the seraphim out there, and all those angels out there announcing my coming. Isn't it amazing? God not only left heaven and became a man. He could have become a king here. He could have set himself. If he could have come as ruler the first time. Yes. King of kings. He is king of kings and lord of lords. Yes. But not only did he belittle himself and humble himself, but he came as the poorest of the poor. He didn't even have a baby's bed. He was, he was in, born in a feed trough. His first baby's bed was a feed trough in a nasty stable. Not like we see in the pictures. It was nasty st stable. And he humbled himself to be born because God came for you and me. God came for the common people. Now God came for everybody, but he understood something. The more power and the more money and the more prestige that some people get, the harder it is to reach those people with the gospel. And you know this to be true. But when you're poor, when many times you're depending on God's provision for your next meal, you're depending on God's provision to be able to pay the bills this month, when you're sick and the doctors say there's no hope, you're depending on the Lord to bring you through and deliver you. That's why God, He said, I came. There's no one too low for God because He started at the bottom as low as He could with an unwed mother, a young teenage girl, probably about 13 or 14. And in that day, most of the times, unwed mothers were stoned to death. So you, you look, look how God, not only did He humble Himself, but look how much He humbled Himself when He came to earth. Just leaving heaven. All the angels up there worshiping Him in glory. And He left all that for you and me. When somebody says, well, I don't think God could forgive me with everything I've done in my life, I don't know that God would forgive me. You don't know my God. Amen. If Judas 
had have turned around and asked God to forgive him after he betrayed him instead of going out and hanging himself, he'd have forgiven Judas. But the devil had too much of a grip on Judas. So it said the crowd, the large crowd who had come from all over the countryside, the common people. But look what they did. They took the branches of a palm tree. Now that meant something in that day. In that day, when someone went out to battle and they won a large battle, they won a, and they came back in, they would take the palm trees and take the branches and lay them out before them as the victor rode in on that white stallion, that big stallion riding in. And palm trees were a sign of victory. Well, it didn't look like victory when Jesus rode in. He didn't look like a great leader riding on a donkey, but they had it right. The palm trees were a sign of victory, a victory to come later. Amen. But look at the people. They went out to meet him, and they began to shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Oh, that sounds so good. Oh, Hosanna, they recognize who he was. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The problem is, three days later, they were yelling, crucify him. Crucify him. The psalmist said in Psalm chapter 2, and verse 6, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. So the psalmist when he said, he, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they were absolutely correct. God had installed him. God had set this date. He knew exactly when he was going to ride into Jerusalem. He knew exactly the moment he was going to die. And he also knew exactly the moment he was going to rise from the tomb and come back. But I want you to look, because this is where I want to make the comparison, in case you've not made it before. I said they, they worshipped him. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But three days later, those same people were yelling, crucify him. Yes. Crucify him. You said, well, what's that have to do with us? Oh, I think a whole lot. People will be sitting in churches this morning yelling, amen, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And then they'll walk out into the world and act as if they'd never heard of him. They'll, they'll be shouting, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, today and tomorrow on Facebook. They'll be putting things on there that shouldn't be said in private, much less public. That's right. They'll be going out there and putting all these maybe good Bible verses on Facebook and on Twitter and talking about how much they love the Lord. But then those same people, you never see them set foot in God's house. That's called hypocrites. You see the similarities? Here's the people throwing out the palm branches for the victor. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then three days later, kill him! Crucify Same people. See the similarities? We haven't changed a whole lot, have we? Some people think because they believe there's a God, they're going to heaven. In fact, most people, they did a survey. Seventy-some percent of the people believe that they were going to heaven. But less than 50% of them believe there's a God. Yet they're, all, they're going to heaven. And the evangelicals, out of the, just, just people who claim to be Christians, 30-some percent of them thought, only 30-some percent of them thought that Jesus was the only way to heaven. That means 67% of people who claim to be Christians think that there's all kinds of ways you can get to heaven. May I point out to you how many people was on that donkey? May I point out to you how many people died on a cross for you and me? Yes. Buddha didn't go to a cross and die for you. Confucius didn't die on a cross for you. Mohammed didn't die on a cross for you, and neither did Mother Mary, by the way. 
Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Amen. And folks, that was a statement of truth, and it hasn't changed. The big argument that's going on now about whether well, they're baptizing in the name of Jesus, and, and it should just be baptizing in the name of Jesus, and not, because nowhere in the Bible is it said that Paul or any of them baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I said, somebody needs to tell Jesus about that. There's a big argument going on about that now. And people are putting it out there who think they're so spiritual. They remind me of the Gnostics back in the day that thought knowledge was a way to the Lord. And they said, well, you, you, you don't baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, somebody should have told Jesus because in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, he says, go ye therefore into all nations, making disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Somebody should have told Jesus he was wrong. I made a little, I pointed out something to these people. They said, well, you should just baptize in the name of Jesus. I said, by the way, you can't just baptize in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus is part of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So if you baptize in the name of one, you baptize in the name of the thro all three, unless you think you can separate the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. It's wonderful. It's, it's amazing what the devil can get people to argue over or split hairs over. It's amazing. And they think they're intellectuals. They think they know more because they come up with these lame brain ideas that they have. If Jesus said baptize in the name of all three, I think you know, it's a pretty good idea. We probably ought to baptize in the name of all three. As I said, if you baptize in the name of Jesus, you're baptizing in the name of all three. You can't, you can't separate the Trinity. They're one. Jesus finding a young donkey sat on it, as was written. Notice he didn't use a chariot. He didn't come riding in on a, a golden chariot with a white steed. In the Song of Solomon, I think this could possibly be the first time I've ever used a scripture and quoted a scripture in my preaching from the Song of Solomon. I can't find a whole lot of it in there to quote from, honestly, but this one fits. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 3, King Solomon has made for himself a, a sedan chair from the timber of Lebanon. And it said he, he made its post of silver, its back of gold, and its seat of purple fabric. And with the interior, it said he lovingly lifted out by the daughters of Jerusalem. That's how Solomon wrote. That's what he made for himself. That's what he wrote around. And everybody knew who King Solomon was. Jesus came riding in. On a donkey. That's right. You know, a, a, a horse wasn't low enough. A donkey was the lowest domesticated animal he could have ridden on. A donkey. Jesus came riding in on a donkey. A young donkey had never been ridden before, by the way. If you ever been around donkeys, or if you ever been around horses, here's a good idea. If the first time you're going to ride, don't get a horse that's never been ridden on before. Because <laughs> you won't ride long. But Jesus did. He, he got a, a colt that had never been ridden. And yet, when he sat down on the colt and rode it, he rode right into Jerusalem with no problem. Mm -hmm. These things his disciples did not understand at the first. Well, that sort of fits right with us. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him that they had done these things to him. Ephesians chapter 1. No, I, I, skipped, uh, I skipped Zechariah, didn't I? Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Yeah, because I, I went right past that. For your daughter, for your fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. And Zechariah said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Same thing. They were quoting that here. Shout and triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. That's why we sang that song this morning. He's just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He did this purposely. This was to fulfill prophecy. He is fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah. But again, we see something else in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 2. Let's fast forward to the end time. I looked and behold a white horse, and he who sat on it had 
a bow and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So we go from Zechariah's prophecy in the Old Testament, Jesus right again on the donkey to fulfill that prophecy, and then when you look at end time, we're going to see him come once again. Behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and he's coming to conquer. Folks, they were looking for him to come as conqueror the first time. He came as a child because they didn't really study the scripture. Which brings me back to what I said. The disciples did not understand. There's so much we have to understand by faith. They didn't understand Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17 and verse 18. Paul said that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation, a knowledge of Him, and I pray that the I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what the hope of His calling, what are the riches of His glory, of the, His inheritance to the saints. <laughs> the disciples didn't understand. You don't understand. I don't understand. But that is why it is imperative that we study the Scriptures. How you say? Well, I don't understand that when I read it. Well then I don't know what the problem is because the Bible says the Holy Spirit will give you interpretation. The Holy Spirit will inspire you. He will explain things to you, things that you don't understand. It has nothing to do with education, how well you can read, how well you can't read, how educated you are. It has nothing to do with the, some of the most educated people in the world or some of the less spiritual people in the world. The only way you can understand this book is when the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. But if you'll sincerely, we talked about this in Sunday school, if you will sincerely pray and sincerely ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what it means and then read, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you what He wants you to know. They didn't understand. Jesus had told them, I'm going to die. Jesus had told them, they're going to put me to death. I won't be with you much longer. It went, whoosh. They, never, they, they heard what he said. Now let's just be honest, everybody here. You said in sermons, probably a lot of my sermons. And you heard what was said. And it went, whoosh. Because it's not what you were listening for. It's not what you were wanting to hear or what you expected to hear. So when it was said, you didn't really hear it. You heard it, but you didn't hear it. You see, they were looking for a king to come to defeat the Romans and take over. So when Jesus said, I won't be with you much longer, they heard him, but they didn't hear him. They didn't understand when he said, I, I, I'm going to die. They didn't, I'll, but I'll rise again in three days. They didn't understand what he was talking about. God did not intend for us to be puzzled by this book. These are love letters from God to you. He, he wrote them so we can know Him better. But if you refuse to read His letters, you'll never know Him any better. But if you will just open his book and read his love letters to you, he'll reveal himself to you. And we talked about, now that's where we had church this morning. <laughs> we talked about how God has revealed himself to each of us in our lifetime. And it's amazing how God can reveal himself to you and you never forget it. And you never forget the feeling that you had when he did. As Art used to like to say all the time, you can have all of God you want. The question is, how much of God do you know? Are you willing to spend time in His Word? Are you willing to spend time on your knees? Because if you're not, you're never going to walk any closer to the Lord. You may have some feel-good moments, but you'll never walk closer to the Lord. God <laughs> loves you. God wants a personal relationship with you. God wants, and get this, because we talked about this, God wants to wrap His arms around you and just love you. 
that we talked a long time this morning at Sunday school about how He's done that in our lives. When God wraps His arms around you and loves you, that's a God they love. Oh, if you ever get a taste of it, you can't wait for heaven because that's what heaven's going to be like all the time. God, a God they love. You're, we're going to be walking around in that glory, in that glow of the Lord all the time, feeling the warmth and the love of God all the time when we get there with Him. That's why I sing that song, face to face. One day we're going to meet Him face to face. And we're going to feel that love all the time. <laughs> I can see why Paul had such a struggle where the Lord take me on home or leave me here to let me witness. I can see why Paul struggled. So the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify about him. Who are you telling about your Jesus? Jesus did not save you and cleanse your slate to keep it a secret. It's amazing. We like to talk about our work, our hobbies, our grandkids. It's amazing how we can carry on a conversation about so many different things, right? just like that. Just, just, just say the word, man. I'm good for the next hour. Want we'll to talk about my grandkids? Greatest grandkids in the world. Let me tell you all about them. But when you see somebody that needs Jesus, we hesitate. Well, I don't want to offend them. Would you like to see them burn in hell? Because that's where they're going unless somebody tells them about Jesus. Doesn't make any difference how good they are. You can't be good enough to get into heaven. Apart from Jesus, you can't get into heaven. When God puts somebody in your path, tell them about your Jesus. Better than that. When you're going through struggles in your life, let them see your Jesus. Because they'll come to you. You won't have to go to them. They'll come to you. Wait a minute. I just I know what you've been going through. I know what you've been dealing with. It doesn't seem to bother you. How in the world can you handle all of this at one time? Well, honestly, I can't. But but I see you, and, and you're and you. But it doesn't seem like it bothers you. Well, I look at it this way. Why should I worry about it when the Lord, my Lord, said He would take care of it? No sense both of us worried about it. So I just go to sleep, get me a good night's sleep, and I at least leave it up to him because he promised he would not give me more than he would not give me a way of escape. First Corinthians 10, 13. God will give you a way of escape. He said, I will, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5. He said, I will be there with you. Psalm 23, we know this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what? I will be there with you. I will be there with you. So, so why should I worry about it if God's got it? <laughs> Let them see Jesus in you. Let them see Jesus working in your life. And I can say, every one of you here, Jesus is working in your life. I can see a difference in you. I can see a difference in every one of you here from where you were a year ago. Jesus is working in your life. Let him strengthen you. Let him grow you. If you've got problems, you don't have a problem. Just give it to him. He said, I'll take care of it. Trust him. Try him. Prove him. Malachi. We should be ready to testify. So it said, for this reason, also the people went and met him because they heard that he had performed these signs. Now there's people that can they'll go to church, they went out to meet Jesus and they go to church for the same reasons. I'll give you three reasons they go to church. Some people went out to meet Jesus and some people come to church out of curiosity. Well I just wonder what they're teaching over there. I wonder what 
what the Bible says. I, I, I wonder why those people think different than I do. I'll just go one Sunday and just listen and see what's going on. They're curious. And sometimes people who are curious get saved. That's a good thing. But they come out of curiosity. But then sometimes people will come out of conscience. And I think probably more than anything else. They know that there's something missing in their life and they don't really know what it is or who it is. But they know something's not right because they, they, may, they may attain more and more money but they're no happier than they were. They, they've gotten a better and better job but they're no happier than they were. Everything in their life seems to be falling into place and everything is just working and they should be the happiest person and they're still miserable. And they realize money came by happiness. Things came by happiness. Why am I so miserable? I should be happy. And they realize there's something missing in my life. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll just do what so-and-so has been after me to do for ages. I'll just go to church one, one Sunday. I'll just go and, and just and see if there's something there that I'm missing. And folks, when those people come and their hearts open and they're really seeking God before they leave, I don't care who's preaching. Well, if they went to Osteen's church or a few more, they could. But if they go to a real church before they leave, God will meet with them there. Amen. And they'll realize Solomon, <laughs> Solomon was the richest man that ever lived. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. And when he got to be an old man, he wrote Ecclesiastes. Let me quote Ecclesiastes for you. Vanity, vanity, vanity. It's all vanity. He said, all of my riches... All of my wisdom. He had everything a man could want. And God had even chosen him and given him that wisdom and said, I'll be with you if you will be obedient to me. Even Solomon understood. Folks, it makes no difference how much money you have, what kind of position you have. What the world thinks of you does not mean anything. If you don't have Jesus, you're miserable. The only thing that counts when you take your last breath, the only thing that counts is not your money, not your position, not what the world thinks of you. When you take your last breath, the only thing that's going to count is your relationship with Jesus Christ. If you know Him, you've got all you need. Well, if I just had a little bit more, I'd be happy. That lie has been perpetrated. Folks, that lie started with Eve. Mm -hmm. In the Garden of Eden. That's where that lie started. Yep. Oh, if you just go over and eat off that tree, don't, don't you worry about what God said. Uh -huh. If you go over and eat off that tree, you're going to be like God. You're going to know good and bad. That's why God doesn't want you to... And the devil is telling you that today. He said, oh, if you, you think, oh, if you just had a little bit more, you'd be, but God wants to cut you. He wants to keep you short. He wants to, to jilt you. He wants to keep you down. He doesn't want you to have anything. But if you had a little bit more, you'd be happy. Eve bought into it. I hope we don't. Why is one of the highest suicide rates in the world among millionaires if money could buy happiness people play the lottery every week hoping to be become a multi-billionaire and most of the people that win it within a few years it's all gone mm -hmm. folks if if they're not going to depend on god for their sustenance now if we can't depend on god now how much you think you're going to depend on him if you were a millionaire well i don't need god anymore i got all kinds of money that's what i need god for Money can't buy your next breath. That's what you need God for. Amen. 
And then some people come for confirmation. I think there's a, a Lord that died for me. And I think I heard that He's the only way of life, the only way I can get to heaven. And I've, I've been told that if I just had Him in my life, I could have peace in my life no matter what I'm going through. And they come and they hear the word and God confirms the word to them and says, I love you. Hallelujah. And no matter what you go through, I'll give you peace to go through it. You can have my peace. You can have my joy. Now that doesn't mean we're not going to have hard times because he did promise us something else. He said, you will be persecuted for my name's sake. And God said, you're going, you're going to suffer. Go all the way back to the Garden of Eden again. What did he tell Eve? He told Eve, he said, you're going to have children, but oh, it's going to be painful. And every woman here that's had a child will say, Amen! <laughs> it's going to be painful. He said, Adam, you're going to, you're going to re get your food from the earth, but you're going to have to toil for it and work for it and work through the thorns. He never, folks, God never promised us a bed of roses. He promised us thorns. That's right. But if you got thorns, eventually there's usually a rose somewhere. So people come for confirmation and they hear the word and they say, that's what I need in my life. I need Jesus. And if you've got Jesus, you've got all you need. You don't need anything else. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you're not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. I love that. Jesus and 12 men and one of them betrayed him. And yet the world had gone after him. Psalm chapter 112 Psalm verses 9 and 10. The psalmist said, He's given freely to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted in honor and the wicked will sit and be vexed. He will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked will perish. The world has gone after him. Oh, how we need that today. We look at America today. We look at the world. The things I see in the world today I never thought I'd see. People don't know if they're men or women. Young children being killed before they're ever born. Violence in the streets. No regard for human life. Oh, how we need today that the world would go after him one more time. I pray that God would bring a revival in this land before he comes back. He's coming back. I know he is because he said so. Oh, how I pray for one more great revival in this land. With all the problems we're having in this country right now, they'd all be settled like that if we just